comes. And I was just talking to Sandra Fillinger back there, and she did not know about this tradition. So, Sandra, will you come out? Uh, actually, both come out. First of all, for that movie. I loved the hand-drawn quality. Not, we're not sitting yet. <laughs> I love the hand-drawn quality of your animation. It was mm -hmm. quite lovely. <laughs> Thank you. And I have to tell you, though, that your animation created a little bit of a dissension in our household because Roger wants a dog. <laughs> and we travel too much or we're away from home too much to really properly take care of it. But after my dog Tulip, he just said, maybe we can change some things <laughs> to get a dog. And he wrote this column, and I think it was after your movie, and he talked about something like um, he could be very happy. Sometimes in his reverie, he could be very happy living in a small room with a uh, rice cooker, his books, and a dog. He didn't mention me. I was so hurt. <laughs> I was so hurt, I wanted a divorce. And so the next column he wrote about a dog, and he also mentioned something about your movie and maybe Umberto D, or he talked about his dog uh, Spot or Blackie or whatever his dog's name was. <laughs> and then he said something about in his reverie, he could live very happily in a little room with a rice cooker, his books, a dog, and Chaz. <laughs> So anyway, I just want you to know what your, what your movie did personally in our household. All right, now we have the golden thumbs, and Nate is going to bring them out. And Sandra was not familiar with this. We have one for you and one for Paul, and our audience knows that they're castings of Roger's thumb, and they're made, this is actually the uh, gold plated is the exact same thing that's on the Oscars. Made for the, it's made by the same company that makes the Academy Awards. So this is the golden thumb. <laughs> this is our version. <laughs> and there's one other thing since we're streaming live one of our special guests is watching, and I told him, some of the audience knows, and r this is going to be very embarrassing that, Rod that I'm going to do this, but I'm doing it anyway. Roger knows that I do believe in sort of harnessing the power of goodwill, and I told David Bordwell that I did this once for Roger when he was sick, and I asked the audience, we're all going to stand up and just beam good positive vibes to David Bordwell to feel better. And he's going to see it streaming. So if you can catch the audience on this, will you please stand? And we're sending good vibes out to David Bordwell. Thank you. The thumbs. Thank you. Get that audience in there. Thank you so much. And David, it's with the Thumbs and the Fearlingers and all of us, and we'll take these from you. And now we'll have our Q&A. Thanks for participating. Thank you. And <laughs> our <laughs> Our M, uh, the moderator for our panel is Matt Zolerzeis, who is, um, as you all, a lot of you know, I'm from Salon.com, 
thehousenextdoor.com, uh, and just a, a very, you know, we, we love reading your work, and we are very happy to have you here again. Thank you. Well, I, I think maybe the first place to, uh, I think the place to begin here is to just say, <laughs> what a movie. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, just to take it back along the timeline, uh, when did you first discover J.R. Ackerley's book? Uh, which of you read it first? How, just how did it come into your life? Um, Sandra found the book. I read it first. <laughs> um, when it came out in the New York Review of Books as uh, part of their classics series, and it was billed as uh, the, the best dog book ever written, and that's how you found it. Right? And, and as, soon as, I, as soon as I read it, or while I was reading it, then I kept telling Sandra this would make an excellent film. And I started writing little notes, post-its, uh, into the pages. And uh, that was about 10 years before we even got, got a thought about really making it into a film. Sandra, did you, re you read the book as well around the same time? Or? Uh, it took me a few years, I think, uh, <laughs> to pick it up. He does all, I find the books, and, and uh, well, pre-Kindle. Yeah. I mm -hmm. found all the books and, and thought I would read it. Does, uh, did, you, did you discuss, what conversations did you have about the adaptation? Did you immediately think it was as adaptable as he did? Did I think yeah. it was? I don't, I don't, Paul, Paul's the storyteller yeah. in the family, and he, the, the, uh, the amounts that he reads, he sees it in images all the time. And I kind of let him go through the process mm -hmm. and then add on to it. Um, the vision of, of how it's going to be. It's the way we work. He draws and then I paint. <laughs> Did you have any hesitation about uh, how to adapt it? The question of whether or not to make it purely narrated, which is what you ended up doing, or to try to break it up into dramatic chunks? No, I always saw it done this way because what uh, attracted me the most was the, the prose, the, the, the beautiful King's English about about dog shit, you know, and <laughs> with, without ever, without ever using that word, it, it, it that amazed me. So I could see I wanted uh, someone who could speak that way, so we would hear the the language in in, in proper British, and then I would do the part of Tulip. I would do the the dog do, and <laughs> and and uh, so. But uh, what what I found. Interesting afterwards was when I showed this to a few friends over, I, I have a lot of friends over the internet who I have never met and I've known them for years from uh, our common uh, user forums from the animation or, or the software forum. And I sent this to a particularly close friend of mine in Germany, a German animator, and he wrote back that it reminds him of a lot of Eric Romer films. Mm. And I had never seen an Eric Romer film or never even heard of one before that. It, Eric Romer came out here in the States about the time we, I had arrived here as an immigrant and I had just other worries on my mind than, than catching up with the latest French, French films. But I found it interesting because I, I think he was spot on Eric Romer films are narrated the same way and, and, and where the, the actor is sometimes talking to the camera and sometimes talking to the, to the actors. And I like that style. And yet at the same time, it's not just a pictorial illustration of the narration. You've got a lot going on in each scene. I guess you would call it background action if it were a more traditional movie. There's an early scene where he's down at the water and you see, uh, not only is he sitting there telling you the story, and the story of him and his dog, but there's also a ship passing in the background, and there's a boy that 
ducks his head up and he's balancing a ball on a stick on the end of his nose. And uh, I wanted to introduce the quirkiness of it. The, the beginning of the film is very important, as everybody I'm sure knows. And <clears throat> we wanted to show in the beginning that he was a prominent person. Ackerley in his book never mentions what he did for a living. And that, that always bothered me. I wanted to know more about him because the, the, the story was so interesting. His, his personality with the dog and everything was so interesting. I guess it's the American inclination to ask people what they do for a living so you can finish the picture of them. So I thought that probably a lot of people uh, among the viewers would, would feel the same way so that we should show who he was in the beginning, that he was a very prominent person in the literary circles of the, of the 1950s post-war. And, and, and uh, <laughs> I didn't lie. Are you sure? I am sure this time, yeah. Where's, where's Ali? I can prove him. <laughs> and, mm. Sorry, I have to, I should explain this. I have to I have to sip water all the time because I too have had my my meeting with with throat cancer and I have a very damaged saliva gland so I have to keep this is my saliva back. Uh, I um, where was I? Post post, post. post. Oh so I, I, I wanted to show that how, how important he was, uh, how well he was known, and uh, the, so he rubbed shoulders with uh, Churchill and Hemingway and, and Bernard Shaw. And interestingly, I found out in my research further on with, uh, through Peter Parker. Peter Parker is a British writer who wrote a, uh, the, the extensive book about Ackerley called Ackerley. And from him, I found out that Ackley actually hated these three people in his <laughs> life. I had no idea. I had no idea, and it was it, it just worked out in this serendipity, and so so I I showed I wanted to show that, and then uh, that scene that you describe by the water. I wanted to give the audience a warning what kind of a film it's going to be like, so that they can sneak out. And there always are people through, throughout. We of course. We have a very sensitive eye for that. People were leaving, and, and, and that happens. We, we know that we don't please everybody. But they also have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> That's true. And, yeah. and, I, and I, as I was remarking to Ali, uh, I, I suspect that the line for the bathroom after this movie was even longer than <laughs> for maybe any other film that's ever been shown at Ebert Fest. <laughs> and there, it's probably short right now, in case anybody's wondering. <laughs> Did, is there a, a, can you talk to me a little bit about the animation, about the design of it? Um, first of all, I'm assuming that computers were involved or, or yes or no, or to yeah. what extent? And can you just walk us through the process of how we, how we come to see these images in the end? They, it, it's all done on, uh, as I said at the beginning, you probably, were you, here, you weren't here when I, we introduced no. the film. I, I explained that already. Yeah, I was. It's talking a, to my daughter, uh, so. Oh, but you, you, uh, you need to hear it. Uh, it it's it's uh, done on a um, uh, Wacom tablet. Are you familiar with a, with a drawing tablet? I came tablet? perilously close to buying that uh -huh. not too long ago. I highly recommend it. Once you start, you can't stop. And so it's all done with a, with a Wacom tablet in uh, a software made in France called TV Paint. And uh, um, Sandra and I have been beta testers for TV paint since they almost, almost from the beginning, about almost 20 years ago when they, when they first developed this software, which, which what's interesting about the software is, for you geeks, uh, it's the oldest uh, animation software in continuous development. It's, uh, there, there were some before that, but they fell to the wayside. They don't exist anymore, and TV paint is uh, the prime software for hand-drawn animation. Is, is there a, um, 
do you did you, do you record the entire narration track and the soundtrack first, and then do some sort of animatics? Or I'm I'm wondering about the relationship between the text and the pictures. We record uh, all the sound as much as we can uh, first, and uh, I don't I don't make storyboards, and I don't. Uh, I don't even, in this case, there weren't even too many animatics. The thing is, storyboards and animatics are a tool to, to communicate with a team, with your clients and, and uh, with your co-workers. And, but since it's just the two of us and we had 100% creative freedom, we didn't have to uh, have any approvals. We didn't have to go through any approval process. Then there was no need to do this. So. We, we wrote it the way you write a book, you know, from first page, once upon a time, and, and we kept drawing until we came to the end. Is there, is there a physical uh, design process as well, or is it exclusively done electronically? No, I, it's I assume just, you probably sketch like mad. Yeah, it's just drawn directly on the screen and... and uh, then Sandra follows a few steps behind and paints it as I'm done. So, no, it's a very uh, straightforward and simple it, process. It totally imitates cell animation. We do it the same way as we would do it on paper and with cells, except I don't have to flip or punch or flip the, the cells to paint on the back of them. Everything is direct, and I can make as many layers as I want. And um, uh, Paul's... Paul still puts each character on its own layer, but then my backgrounds have a lot more color layers built up, just like a watercolor. <coughs> and now, can you uh, can you talk a little bit? You sort of addressed this on a previous panel, but the just the mentality of dog owners and sort of how the book captured that for you. What sort of chord it struck? I I think that's why. I like the book so much too because I had the same, uh, I, I have the same viewpoint of dog owners as, as Ackerley does, uh, except Ackerley was a, was a novice himself. This was the only dog he had in his whole life. And uh, before he acquired Tulip, then he actually didn't care for dogs too much. He, he, uh, they made him miserable, they barked too much. <laughs> and once he got his own, then he, was so tolerant of these. Supreme, this. Supremely <laughs> indulgent of right, his own right. dog. But uh, I always had dogs all my life. I've, I've had many dogs. And so I'm used to them dying. And, and I, um, I see them as, I, I really understand dog as a part of nature. I have never seen uh, dogs as children or anything like that. So I, I understand dogs and I think I have uh, accurately then understood them too they're they're just uh, they're whores you know they're they're prostitutes they, they are they are very professional they're very good at it and 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 what I like about him is at the end where he says uh, th that the wolves tamed um, men uh, turned out to be true he was he was very prescient when he said that because only recently, in the last few years, have uh, uh, scientists come to the conclusion that it was the wolf that had tamed the caveman and not the other way around, which makes perfect sense that, that they stuck their cute, cutest puppies forward <laughs> so that they could, they could take advantage of men having the ability to throw things at, at animals and, and instead of chasing them. So they they worked together like this, but it was it was really the the animal that that uh, tamed men to to do what the animals want them to do. And our dogs, especially Jack Russells, do this very well. They they teach us or they train us more than we train them. Mm. At least they're more successful. Yeah. The, uh, the I was struck by the the way that what was on screen. Sometimes it didn't diverge from what we were being told in the narration, but it maybe gave us another dimension or another detail to it. And 
the way that, for example, when he feels that when he's uh, out at the, uh, the, I guess the country manor, and he, he, you picture him in the stockades, which is a much deeper, a deeper way to depict his embarrassment right. than if you had simply heard that narration or read it. How does his, how do, how do you think your view of him perhaps differs from the view that he is presenting of himself? Well, if I understand you correctly, and I'm not sure that I do, uh, it's, it's a vehicle that we have uh, gotten used to using all the time in our, in our films, that you can, you can you, in animation, you can go beyond just telling the, the story that, that exists. You can go and pretend that you can read the minds of people and, and uh, you can make up stuff about what they're probably thinking. So uh, it, it's what makes it an interesting film. This film could not work as a live action film. Even if you have a wonderfully trained set of German shepherds, you <laughs> lookalikes, you still couldn't do it because there isn't that much to, to, to tell. And uh, most of the story here is, or a lot of the story is really what's on what's in his mind. There are two mm -hmm. stories, or there are three stories told. His memories, mm -hmm. his early memories, and then, then his, his wishes that he never gets to fulfill. So he wishes that he told the woman something, or he wishes that he would meet such and such a person. So that I told with the sketchbook drawings. He Ackerley did draw very well himself, although he never illustrated his books. He drew actually better than that. I, I, I made it look simpler just because I wanted to make it a big difference from the so-called realistic drawings. Can you talk a little bit about the voice actors, Christopher Plummer and Lynn Redgrave and Isabella Rossellini? How much do you want to hear? Uh, it's, uh, I, I actually don't see too many movies. Neither, neither of us do. And I, n I had never heard of Christopher Palmer. <laughs> and and uh, uh, San Sandra... <laughs> San Sandra picked him. It, it wasn't, it, it's not difficult to get famous actors to do voiceover for animation because it's it's not a bad gig for them no matter <clears throat> how successful they already are and how much money they have it's it's one or two days of work with no rehearsals and you read it no you don't have to memorize anything <coughs> <coughs> so um it looked as if we're gonna, we'll have to go to England to, to record all our actors, all our voiceovers. The budget wasn't that strong. Uh, we decided that it's worth trying first here in, the, in, in New York. And sure enough, we found <coughs> all the British sounding actors we needed right in New York. And, <coughs> and when, when Plummer came to the studio, then uh, I had this big book that, uh, uh, Peter Parker wrote about Ackerley in my hand, and I wanted to show him, th there are lots of photographs in there, the photographs, for instance, that you saw at the end in the title, and I asked him if he had ever read Ackerley, and I wasn't surprised when, when he said no, because really, the, the book is just about forgotten, and, but he didn't say just no, he, he slammed the book with my hands down on, on the table and, and my fingers pinned underneath this book. And he, and he said, no, and I don't need to. And I said, there, there are um, pictures in there and I thought there are photographs that you would be interested. And he said, no, I'm only interested in doing the work here, so where's the booth? And he was extremely, <laughs> extremely unfriendly. <laughs> and, and uh, he, he went to the, into the booth and, and I, so I started directing. And I said, would you 
Would you like me to explain how I see uh, accurately? Or <laughs> and, and he said, no. <laughs> I, will, I will read you how I'm going to do accurately. <laughs> and, and he started reading him, and, he, and he, he read like this. My dog is an old bitch whose name is... And with this shaky old man, and I, I had a sense that he maybe had never even read the, the script or anything. And it said at the beginning on the title that it's about an old man and his dog. So, so he probably thought it's that old a man. I had about the first six minutes of the film, uh, the opening, and, and, and I had it on my laptop there. And I said, I have about six minutes here and I have him already animated, so would you like to see? He's not as old as you portray him, and so would you like to? said, no, there's no need, you can explain it to me. And, and I, I said, no, it would really help. And I talked him into coming out of the booth, which, which was really paining him. And, <laughs> and, he, and he looked at it and, you know, in this kind of childish way, so to show that he's really not interested, he just stood with his back to, to it and, <laughs> and watched it like that. And, and, and after he saw about a minute or two of it, he said, I've seen enough. And, and he went back into the booth. And I said, well, I, I hear him like this. And I started, I did the cardinal mistake that, yeah. that I, I actually didn't know that it's considered a cardinal mistake. I read his lines. I, I didn't, I had never even heard that expression and he flew out of the booth and he started pacing the, the control room there. And he said, the last time someone read my lines for me was 50 years ago and he went on and on. And everybody in, in the booth, nobody knew what to do. They felt sorry for me. And, <laughs> and, and, and they just stared into their papers. And, and what was going through my head was, I know how much the producer has already paid him, $50,000 for this, and it looks like I won't be able to work with him. What are we going to do? So, so am I going to, uh, uh, is, is he, will he pay for somebody else the same amount? It's, and I didn't, I, I just dreaded that whole complication, so I just bit the bullet and decided to, to behave as, as, to be the adult in the room and, <laughs> and, and just took it in stride or pretended to take it in stride. And after a while, we got along. Uh, after I gave him a few instructions, which he accepted, then, and then we worked and it went on to the next day. The next day he came, <clears throat> uh, totally different attitude towards me. He was extremely congenial and he started <clears throat> he started humoring me with these stories about Prague and and so to me it was clear that he didn't know anything about me the first day and now he did his homework and he and he checked out on me and and decided that that I'm worthy of of directing him <laughs> and because I have experience and and now we've skipped three years ahead and the film was invited to Toronto, to the Toronto Festival, and we were to go through this whole circus of interviews together, Plummer, Lynn Redgrave, and I. Sandra couldn't make it there. And I had to take care of the dogs. <laughs> yes, Roger. Roger Ebert, that's what happens. <laughs> and, and, uh, but he, 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 uh, he didn't miss the plane. The, the plane, uh, the plane didn't show up and he, he came late. So I had to do the first interviews alone. And in one or two of these interviews, I told 
this story, but in an abbreviated way. Mm -hmm. And then when he showed up and we started, we continued doing these interviews and he was always asked to interview first. And he, he said wonderful things about me. He, told, he spoke in glowing terms about what a wonderful professional director I am. <laughs> and, and I, so when he came out, I, I thought, well, here I go again. I, 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 I messed this up again. So I have to tell him the truth because he's going to find out one day. And I said, you were very gracious the way you described me there. And I have to tell you that I, I wasn't as gracious towards you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he said, oh, what, what, did you, what, did, what did you say? And I said, well, I told that story about, about reading your lines. And, and he whipped around and he said, good. Keep telling it. <laughs> so that's why I'm not afraid to, to, to say it. And maybe he's watching. It's a public service for actors <laughs> yeah. everywhere. Yeah. And on that note, let's take a few questions. If we could. Let's see. We have uh, microphones there. Yeah. Uh, in the back? Well, I'm looking for a microphone, if we have one. OK. Oh, yeah, there you go. Do I need to stand up? We can, we can see you. That's OK. Either wonderful, way. wonderful, wonderful, wonderful film. A question, how many frames a second does um, that amount to? Uh, it, it's, it's made for a film, even though what we saw here was from a digitape, which I am I'm so glad because that is the best quality since it was made digitally. But it was, uh, we made it at uh, 24 frames a second, which means 12 drawings per second. Uh, every drawing is, is shot twice or a computer doesn't shoot anything but is, is exposed twice. And, uh, but, but the math is, is difficult. I'm always asked that question, how many drawings did it take? Uh, the thing is, a, a scene, as, as Sandra said, it's on layers, so, so there's always, the man is on one layer, the dog is on another layer, then if there are other dogs and other people in there, there are layers and layers. Sometimes uh, of they are, uh, sometimes they're cycled, but I don't do too many cycles. I don't like to do that. But definitely, it's more than 24 drawings a second. And, and I've, I've, never, I've never counted them. Center House Rear. Hi, I love this movie. I'm right here. And what I need to know is um, whether it's in DVD, because I have an animator, animator daughter that really needs this. <laughs> I, she really does. Uh, the, the DVD is coming out, I think, this month. And uh, if not this month, then next. But I'm pretty sure it's this. I just, on my i, whatever it is, phone, I just um, saw on Amazon, I think you can download it already. And then the DVD is supposed to come out. They keep pushing it. Um, but on demand or whatever this the. The stuff is now is, I think, available. It is streaming on Netflix? OK. Uh, down in the center towards the aisle. Hi. Uh, great movie, definitely. Uh, the thing that was most uh, intriguing to me was the pure infusion of imagination when it came to uh, everyday objects being used in the storytelling, like a postcard, and it, it went from being in his flat to being, in fact, on the beach instead of being an actual house or figurines that became the characters or, you know, a book being used at the front door. Mm -hmm. how, how were you inspired to make that a part of the storyline? Because it seemed very inherent in the story and very natural the way it flowed through. I, I, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. Always trying. We're both always trying to find a surprise to, 
to turn something into a surprise. It's the only way to keep the film fresh. And I was really painfully, thoroughly aware that this is going to be a wall-to-wall -wall narrated film by the same voice. And uh, so I, I, or both of us, we, we designed that scene by the, uh, at, at the shore, as we say in Philadelphia. <laughs> I forgot sure. how they say uh, how they say, <laughs> and and uh, so I decided to give it a, another twist because he was saying he, the Ackerley uses words like he was the trump card, and that made me think of a postcard, and and I I so I uh, thought that we would we could set up these these postcards because it's also a condemnation. Ackerley wrote the book as a condemnation of British middle class life and uh, especially post-war. Another proof that this was post-war. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and he, and, and I have to make a tiny little, please forgive me, a little sidetrack to, to Ali again. Ali was right this morning about the DVD in, in Turkey. It was, we found out, it was a legit DVD. There was a, a, a there's a producer in, or a distributor, a small distributor in Canada who had the permission to distribute uh, the film in the Middle East and, and, and the Far East and to, uh, uh, to put out, to make his own decisions about that. So we didn't know it, and I apologize. You were have to, right. Uh, up in the back again. Okay, someone asked me to ask this question. They were a little shy. They, um, they said that there was an inordinate amount of um, uh, Tulip's sex life in the movie, and they wanted to know the thinking behind um, <laughs> doing that. And they even went as far as saying that some of the scenes, segments about Tulip's sex life could have been part of the porn movie for Bobby Pickering's <laughs> movie last night, Natural Selection. <laughs> so anyway, really, it's, it's more just the thinking about how, how much was this based on the, the, the uh, Ackerley's book? How much based on your experience with dogs? And um, just thank you. <laughs> well, it was, it was based on, on the book. Uh, we, we stuck very carefully to the book. I always believe that, that uh, the, uh, films should stick to, to the book. And, and the thing is, if you like dogs, if you know dogs, then this sh would not come. Do you have a dog? Can I ask you a question? This was Chaz. Chaz. Oh, oh, Chaz oh, oh. Somebody else. Somebody who she tried to ask. Oh, that you asked. Did that? Does that person have a dog? Be because dog, dog people understand this very well. They know that dogs are all about eating, dumping, and humping, and and. <laughs> And sniff and lick. <laughs> that that's that's their purpose in life, and 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 begging for food, and shedding all nice things. <laughs> Down in the front, great film. Uh, I was just wondering if you felt that if you feel fortunate for being recognized for this work, the way animation is being pigeonholed these days. Uh, some people think of animation, the young crowd usually think of animation as CGI. Yours is computer related, but not the way it's constructed these days by Pixar or DreamWorks. And your work was, was cited, or was uh, nominated, I believe, for an Academy Award. And uh, it was a contender. Yeah, and I was wondering if you, if you feel fortunate that you're recognized since hand-drawn isn't, isn't that noticed as much as before. Frankly, I'm not surprised. Uh, this is a discussion that we have on our uh, software forum all the time. We constantly discuss 2D animation and 3D animation. B uh, by the way, 3D animation is considered computer-generated animation. This is not computer-generated. This is human hand, mind still generated. And, and uh, uh, I, I think the trend has become pretty obvious to us to uh, you know, people are getting tired of, of 3D only animation and are beginning to appreciate handmade animation. 
So we weren't surprised about that. About, the, about what surprised us was the reviews we got. We got just fabulous reviews from, from everybody. And our producer said, you know, it's very important to get the first review, a good one, and from New York. And if you get a good New York review, then from then on, everybody is going to imitate it, everybody is going to, which I, I think is a lot of baloney. Then I, it wouldn't be possible for so many people uh, far away from New York to just say, oh, that uh, the New York Times wrote about this well, so I better write about it. Would you agree that that's I think there's an aspect, I think there may be an element of truth to that, but, but the counterweight is that often when New York gets to something first, uh, Los Angeles and other cities will go the other way <laughs> yes. to show that they're not fine. And you see yeah. that in, particularly in awards season at the yeah. end of the year when New York film critics and the LA film critics, sometimes LA goes first and New York goes second and sometimes it's the reverse. And you'll often see that one of the groups seems to be reacting against the other one and showing that they're independent and they're also, not following the herd. Also, all the animation studios are in California, too. Mm -hmm. So, so we we were, were our lines were very shaky. Are you going to talk about that, Paul? How no, disturbing they were? Uh. Well, a lot of criticism of um, people got very anxious at the shaky lines and the roughness of it because they're so adapted to the smooth bubbles and Mickey Mouse ears and big round eyes that animation has these days and um, so those that was kind of I was a little defensive when I started reading those reviews and then I w even watching it tonight I thought oh my god it's shaky <laughs> it's really our next one is not that shaky uh, well but yeah it's a, it was just a different way of going about it but I think don't you feel that there was more room for variety if you look at the types of animated features that were being released in the 60s, the 70s, all the way into the 80s, it wasn't all uniform. It Whereas now, I think it wa is more uniform exactly. for the most part. Yes, yes, and that's why I, I, I wasn't so surprised that, uh, that it turned out that people do like uh, 2D animation, hand-drawn animation. But uh, it's, it's an interesting thing about the, uh, the connection between uh, an Oscar con contender and uh, being Oscar nominated, there, there's a point system in the Oscars that uh, who becomes a contender and they look at reviews and they give every re a good review uh, one point and every bad review minus two points, I, th I think something like that. Paul, you're talking to a movie theater full of people who know this stuff. Well. We don't know anything about Oscars. Uh, so this is what I, uh, this is what I know. This is what, uh, what, what was explained to me by our producer who knows everything about. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the point system you mean that? Yeah. That, no, it is that uh, uh, one, one point for a good review and, and minus two points for a bad review. So rarely does a film get uh, ab above, um, around 80 points. And, and this year, or 19, uh, uh, 2010, uh, there were three films that had above 90. And that was, um, I can't remember. Uh, uh, the, the three above 90 were, the one that got the Oscar, Toy Story. Toy Story and then the, the second one was, uh, Train, oh, train your dragon, dragon. Yeah. and and the third one was tulip so because there were so many good reviews tulip uh, had a high number yet it didn't get the nomination because that's not everything that counts and and the the academy awards is uh, uh it's a it's an in-house uh, self-congratulatory award i never counted on getting an Oscar at all, or even being a contender, we we just knew that we are not in 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 that league or in that category. It's not the league so much, the the level of our of our uh, craft, but it's uh, it's just um, they they have their own sandbox. We are, we don't play with them. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah,
Yes. Uh, I'm curious if the book was in the public domain or if you had to negotiate for the rights, and, and if so, what was that process like? It costs money, and, and I was surprised how much it costs. I can tell you that, uh, how much it was. It was $100,000 for the book. And I was really surprised because the book isn't that um, popular anymore. And uh, also, there are no heirs. Uh, uh, Ackerley was a homosexual, and he had no children, and, and, uh, and, and the, uh, the proceeds go to a wonderful cause. There's an Ackerley Award given every year to the best writer in English of, um, of I think, biography. And so, so they, got, they get the most of the money, so, so I was happy about that. But 100,000 was, I thought, was, was pretty stiff. And then uh, the, the story of My Dog Tulip isn't, really isn't enough even for an animator to make up for a whole film. So he, the Ackery wrote three other books, and uh, we picked from those books some of the stories, and I thought, well, since we paid so much for it, and it's a law firm in England that, that collects this money and that uh, the producers had to deal with, then uh, I'm sure they, they won't have any objection if we use a couple of lines from the other books. And they said, no, we would have to pay another $100,000 for each one. The thing is, something I didn't know that I learned, copyright goes only for the copy. It doesn't go for the story. Nobody can copyright a story. So. I can use, we can use the, st the stories from the other books, but we can't use the language, we, we can't use his text. And that's where Peter Parker came into, into play, that he, he, he can write so well and so close to, to Ackerley that, that um, there were about 20% of it was written by Peter Parker. Yeah, I wrote a couple of lines too, yeah, in my King's English. Yes, in the middle. Hi, I want to thank you. This is the uh, second time I've seen this movie, and it is the movie that myself and my husband, and yes, we are dog owners, and yes, he's from England, um, tell everyone they have to see. And I've been talking to anyone who sat around me the last two days about how fantastic and beautiful this movie is. And I really want to say that I really call it a love story, um, not a traditional Western one, but really the nature of the kinship and relationship that human beings have specifically for their dogs in this country. And I guess I think Ackerley and your work showcases that. Just thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Balcony. Balcony? Oh, balcony up here. Okay. Yes. Uh, two things. Uh, the uh, printed guide says that the there's no MPAA rating. Could you comment on that? And also, what was the reception of the film in England or in Britain like? It's just coming out in Britain now, this, this month. Uh, it's by a totally different distributor, totally different path. We know very little about it. Uh, uh, and, and that's about the extent of it. I think the DVD is coming out right now in England also. Uh, uh, about the... What was the first question? The rating. The rating. Yeah, that 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 was strange. We, we're not quite sure. It, this was a very low budget film. It cost uh, the producers uh, 1.3 million dollars, of which we were the least. Uh, the, the, of the of the cost. We were the point. <laughs> we were the. <laughs> we, and what came after the point? And and. Of the, the producer said, kind of complained about how much things are costing now in post-production that the rating alone cost, I believe he said $10,000. $10, I think that's the figure. That's what it costs. I had no idea that, that somebody is making money on just walking into the theater and, and, and agreeing that yes, this should be an R-rated movie. The producer wanted that badly. He wanted an R-rated movie. He thought that that would, w would do well for sales for some reason. That and seems bizarre to me. Yeah, I, I could tell you more. <laughs> and, 
And why suddenly it never got a rating, I don't know. I really don't know. Well, I, I, I was wondering about, I was thinking about the content of this movie, and I have two kids myself, four, 14 and almost 14 and seven, and I was thinking, would this be appropriate for them? And I, I often find that when a movie is about a subject that a child might enjoy, but is not necessarily a G-rated Disney type of film, I tend to engage with it more as a parent. I feel that you know the ratings often shut down that kind of engagement. You look at something and go, oh, that's rated R, that's not appropriate. So you would watch it with your kids? I think my older one, yeah. Not the 12-year-old? The, well, I think, yeah, the 13 or 14-year-old can handle it, and the seven-year-old could too, although uh, it would be my choosing not to show it to him because there were certain things I felt probably would feel like I didn't want to explain <laughs> at that particular point. But uh, I, didn't, I don't see anything objectionable. It all depends on what sort of background you come from and how comfortable you are discussing the unmentionables. I think it, it works very well, uh, and I, I've recommended it to a few people. It works very well as a birds and a bee story. If you feel uncomfortable about, then it's really about nature. You know, that's how it works in nature. And I don't think that children should be told only things that they, they understand. Uh, they should be told mostly things that they don't understand should yes. be shown. And, and that's, that's what life is all about for them. They are, th that's their way of life. They're used to not knowing many things mm -hmm. and, and being inquisitive about it. So pandering to kids and showing them only uh, stuff that they, they would understand is, is very stupid. Well, and I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, often, I often find that that kind of thing is more about, it's more about the parents than it is the children because as I am discovering, uh -huh. My children tend to be two or three years more advanced in terms of how much they know than I think they are. And uh, I remember being a kid, and I was pretty good about hiding that from my parents, what I, what I knew, of course. the level of innocence. Other questions? Right in front of you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, down here. I just wanted to comment on what you were just saying. Um, one of the things I liked about the film was the fact that it was the main character was an observer the entire time, and it's all about things you don't understand or you want to understand a little bit more. So you wouldn't have to necessarily explain it because we don't understand it either. It's human nature. So I would agree with you on that, and I thought it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition, my question was, how much of your own dogs ended up in the film, and where do they sleep at night? <laughs> oh, with who? the place. They have their pick and choosing of anywhere they want to go. Um, it depends on who fed them last. <laughs> <laughs> I always do. So they'll <laughs> sleep with me. We, we, we have a, a, a Jack Russell, a Russell Terrier now, and, and who did a lot of the voiceovers, the, 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 the whining in the dark from the bedroom, and that, that was a Jack Russell whine, not a German Shepherd whine at all. And uh, what's ab about the, uh, the bark tracks, what's interesting is uh, our, our composer and sound engineer, everything about sound man, uh, he wanted to do this very diligently, wanted to do everything right, and we decided that we are going to get up front all the, the most German Shepherd kinds of sounds that we can get, and he had lined up a whole uh, uh, a, a, a whole collection of people that he's going to visit and, and record their dogs. And early on, he found out that they don't have too much of a variety. They all sound alike, really. Mm. And, and we ended up, he had lots of recordings, but we ended up using, I think, only about two or three dogs. Mm -hmm. And uh, The dogs know, that were the best actors, perhaps. <laughs> well... You know, with an animator, you have to watch out. I'm an animator. Yeah. And, and uh, a lot of uh, people would often say how well um, the plumber fit the type, you know, how, he, he, how well uh, he acted the part. And what they don't realize is I made the part fit to plumber's voice. His voice came first. And I had a totally different view of Ackerley what type of person he's going to be. Given your early experience with Christopher Plummer, did you have to re resist the temptation to editorialize in your drawings? And <laughs> no, we... Show we, him relieving himself more often. <laughs> we, 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 got along, we got along fine afterwards. 
Yeah, so uh, I, I, had, I had no animosity towards him, and we did s several pickups afterwards, and he was very generous about that, didn't charge any extra money, and, and um, w yeah, it was very generous. Anybody else? Yes, last question. Um, when Ackerley made the decision to get out that flour sack in the bucket, I found that jarringly inconsistent with his character. Uh, this is a question back to story interpretation. Is this something that you guys had to discuss? Was this a break from what was written in the original book? Or I just said, whoa, this guy wouldn't do that, if not after all the trouble he went through to get her pregnant. So, Well, not only that, he regretted not doing it, actually. So uh, you have to realize in those days, in the 1950s, <laughs> not 40, in, in the 19... <laughs> In, in, the 19, in the 1950s, uh, uh, people d didn't worry. That was the only way of, um, of, of euthanizing an animal. They never thought of, uh, of um, castration or anything like that. And uh, he, he really worried about what is he going to do with eight puppies. So it was a common, it was a common thing to do. It's, it's not as shocking as it is today, if somebody would do that. And having many dogs in, in my own life, uh, I understand that because I was, uh, I, I once got a, a very st stupid dog, and, and it was a pedigree dog, I paid good money for it, a, a little Boston Terrier, and, and the dog was, was, was just a very um, a poorly made dog. And, 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 and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't stand him as a, as a puppy, and <clears throat> I had him uh, put down or, or put to sleep or whatever uh, uh, expression you want to choose, and, and never, never felt anything about it at all. It's, it, it is, in the end, we have that kind of power, and I think it's in all of us to abuse that power to a certain degree. But on the other hand, uh, we made a film called Still Life with Animated Dogs for PBS, and there's uh, the, the, the heartbreaker or the, the heart stomper, the heart, heart stopper in that story is that I actually uh, put my own dog to sleep with a lethal injection. And it was, it, it was well based for me, and that is I had one opportunity to escape this terrible, terrible, oppressive country. And I had a window. I found a window where I could escape, <clears throat> and the dog was in the way. And so I put the dog down. And I got so many, not so many, we got a, a couple dozen letters over the years from PBS viewers who were very angry with me, called me all sorts of names for doing that. And that I find excessive also. That, that makes no sense to me. Uh, the, the dog was um, six or seven years old, and uh, in, in that country it would have been impossible to find on quick notice somebody who would, uh, who would adopt him. The food was scarce, uh, dog food didn't exist. You had to have a certain kind of lifestyle where you could afford to to have a dog like that, he was raised by me, had a lot of, lot of freedom and, and uh, a lot of attention. And he, that dog would have ended up just, uh, uh, I don't know, not well. It, it, it couldn't have had a good ending. He could have been bossy. Or could it, yes, could it end up? End up Somebody uh, eating him. Yeah, a lot of people eat dogs in, or in those days they, they did eat dogs. I ate my dog once, but that's another story. I, 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 I didn't do it. It was somebody, it was a prank in, in, in art school. They, they killed you, you my dog. You might as well just tell us. <laughs> I, I had a dog. I could never live without a dog, and I had a dog there, and the dog um, was wasn't well behaved and bit a few, a uh, couple of children, not seriously, but did bit, bite and killed some chicken and things like that. There were complaints about it and that why does a student uh, in, a, in a dorm, why does he even have a dog and how is it allowed? 
and, <clears throat> and I didn't have the heart to do anything about it. And so my fellow students wanted to <clears throat> expedite things for me <clears throat> and resolve it and help me out. So they killed the dog. And then they cooked it. It was, it was a, a, a St. Bernard, a young St. Bernard. And they, they cooked it and they, they told me that they had, um, they found a badger, a run over badger, badger, and that if I ever ate badger, if I would be interested, I said no, never. And it was a lot of chestnut and all that. So, so I enjoyed the meal with them. And then, and then they said, uh, by the way, have you done anything about about your dog, have you, have you got a license for him or anything? And, and I said, no, no, I know, I have to do it. I keep postponing it. And they handed me this pan now full of bones on me. And, and they said, well, here, take this down to the town hall. And <laughs> so I, I knew what, what had happened. You want to ask us a pleasant question? <laughs> I was going to say, I never had a friend like that. <laughs> kind of jealous. Uh, I do think we're out of time, though. Uh, how do you feel about puppies and rainbows and unicorns and kittens? Aren't they wonderful? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming.